The following message has been brought to you by the Mile High Flood District. Hi, my name is Dave Scudis, and I am a watershed manager at the Mile High Flood District in Denver, Colorado. The Mile High Flood District is a special district that encompasses the greater metro Denver area. We facilitate the rhyme and reason to how our urban waterways are managed as they cross city and county boundaries. At the district, we work to protect people, property, and the environment from the devastating impacts of extreme flooding and the chronic impacts caused by urbanization. One of the ways we accomplish our mission is by constructing flood mitigation projects where neighborhoods have been built in flood prone areas. The National Flood Insurance Act was passed in 1968, which triggered the widespread mapping of flood risk around the country. So many neighborhoods built prior to 1968 weren't planned around flood risk very well. So over the past 50 years, the district has been working with the 40 cities and counties in the Denver metro region to mitigate for some of the flood risk our residents are forced to live with. In this video, I'm going to share a look back at a flood mitigation project that was 20 years in the making. A project we completed just last year, working with our local government partners, Adams County and the city of Thornton. This is a project that took over 20 years to fund, design, and construct at a cost of around $8 million. The original funding agreement between the district and Adams County dates back to 1997 when I was a sophomore in college. I started working here at the district back in 2010 and one of the first meetings I went to was at an office located right about here to talk about this project. The goal was to reduce the flood risk for a few dozen homes and businesses. So why did this project take so long? Well because it's very time consuming, expensive, and messy in every way you can imagine to address flood risk after an area has already developed. It also took a while because Adams County now has a stormwater enterprise fund to help pay for the project, funding not previously available. The city of Thornton was also a stakeholder and became a funding partner in this project as well. Most capital improvement projects we build are necessitated because of prior land use decisions that were either oblivious to flood risk or because they created really undersized or high maintenance infrastructure that we're now forced to deal with using taxpayer dollars. And this project is no different. Here we had to deal with four road crossings, a railroad crossing, and two ditch crossings, making this project very, very structural. We also had space constraints. You can see on this map in red, the currently mapped 100 year flood risk. The risk from Hoffman starts interacting with the South Platte River down on the right side. In blue is the post project floodplain that we have been able to achieve. It's so narrow because that's all the space we had. When this site was developed many decades ago, they shoved the creek to the north, turning it into a roadside ditch along 86th Avenue but the red floodplain is the natural low point. This is where the water wants to go. As we zoom into the area from Rainbow to Devonshire, you can see how the floodplain diverges away from the main channel of the creek. This is because the creek is piped through this section here and the pipe isn't big enough. So any flow that doesn't go into the pipe finds the topographic low point rather than the roadside ditch perched along the hillside. Now, gravity, right? And here is the view looking west from Devonshire. The pipe is underground near that tree. And this is after we dug the old corrugated metal pipe up and started excavating our new channel section. Now drainage features that are really structural using say metal or even concrete, they don't last forever. And when that infrastructure wears out, it's a hefty bill. After only a few decades, this pipe looked like a crushed soda can. This is what failed infrastructure looks like. And here is the entrance of the pipe. The pipe is grossly undersized. So when it is overwhelmed, the road and adjacent homes get flooded. Then the excess water flows along the surface through this field and floods some homes alongside it. And those mattresses will do a wonderful job of finding something to plug when they float downstream. 
and here's where it floods the precaster even though the main channel has been pushed over to the left. Eventually it all gets to the South Platte River. The area was strewn with a spaghetti works of utilities with some right in the creek like this sanitary sewer line. Yes, that's actively carrying sewage or this water meter vault also active. We also have our own version of what we like to call Creek Bingo. Let's see the lovely random items people left for us. We have concrete rubble, uh, satellite dishes, car parts, truck parts, and even animal carcasses. I know that's gross, but we almost lost count of the quantity and species of animal carcasses discovered along the project. True story. Before I show you the improvements that we built, I'd like to show you how we ideally build projects when we have enough space. Our goal is to create what's called a high functioning and low maintenance stream or heflums. A heflums not only minimizes flood risk, but it also mimics natural stream processes, which leads to lower life cycle costs and creates an abundance of ecological and community values on a daily basis when there is no flood. When we have sufficient room like this, we have room for daily flows. The bank full flow, which is the flood event that's both common enough and big enough that it does the most work on the bed and banks. And when the rare but large flood events come through, the flows can spread out with the water getting inches deeper rather than feet deeper. Here we may only require maintenance with a weed whacker and a trash bag, and vegetation creates stability instead of a bunch of rock, metal, or concrete. As an example of a Heflums, here is Westerly Creek north of MLK Boulevard in Denver. Keep an eye on this pedestrian bridge in the background. Here it is during the peak of the 2013 flood. And here is the same location the very next day. And then back to this photo that I started with. This is from eight months after the flood. There were no airlift evacuations here and we didn't need to perform any maintenance even after a flood like that. And yes, this is an engineered constructed channel that used to sit in an underground pipe under the runways of the old Stapleton Airport before Denver International Airport was built in the 1990s. The creek section I just showed you was viewed from the bridge on the bottom right corner of the photo. Conversely, really structural drainage features provide very little function on a daily basis and they constrict the flow, which is why you see all of this concrete to keep the thing glued together as the flow gets deeper and deeper with no room to spread out. Now I'll admit features like this are probably very low maintenance until someday when they're not. Large rock structures like this are similar. Note there are actually 10 people on this structure and I counted over 200 boulders. Also probably very low maintenance until it's not, like this failed structure on Sand Creek. There used to be boulders here and a void has formed underneath these boulders in the background so it's just a matter of time until the entire structure crumbles. This is a 20 foot tall drop structure. Note the semi trucks on the upper left for a sense of scale. Fixing this could be hundreds of thousands of dollars. Because of space constraints, Hoffman is going to likely be high maintenance in the long run. We were so confined, we had to import rock to line the channel, like you see here. We had to slip structures under this water supply pipe. Here we had to build a bridge to take a water supply ditch over our creek. We had to relocate water lines, sewer lines, gas lines, power lines, and sometimes they just broke like this water line. The road was the only construction access along 86th Avenue and the pavement didn't hold up to excavators and dump trucks. So we had to close the road and spend a million dollars replacing the entire stretch from Welby Avenue to Steel Street, a frustrating expense for a drainage project. Old roads are like walls in a really old house. So when we do projects like this, it sometimes feels like one of those home shows where they're renovating a really old house and they, they get into a wall and they, they discover like, oh my gosh, there's mold in here, or there's old electrical wiring, or we weren't counting on putting in a steel beam. Digging into old roads feels very similar to that. We just never know what we're gonna come across. So addressing flood control after an area has already developed, particularly if it developed 100 years ago, it's very expensive and exceedingly difficult.
But even though this wasn't how we ideally like to do things, I'm very proud of the improvement we made. The delta compared to what we had to start with is as profound as any project I've ever been a part of. We reduced flood risk to homes, businesses, roads, and railroads. And here are a few before and after photos just to illustrate. This is at Rainbow Avenue. And then here we are at that old CMP pipe I showed you earlier, the open channel we were able to create. Uh, back to one of our, our sewer lines crossing the creek there in the foreground. And here's the same site afterwards. And then the area along 86th Avenue and looking the other direction at that same sewer line crossing. And from the other end near Steel Street, you can see how confined and narrow that was before and how much we were able to widen it out, pushing the road off to the right. I did a little math and I figured out this project would have cost half as much if we could have built it using our modern approach to urban stream design, using a Heflum's approach. It would have cost half as much as this really confined and structural mitigation project. I made this video to show you some of the work we do at the Mile High Flood District to mitigate for flood risk where neighborhoods have been built in flood prone areas like this. As our city keeps expanding through new development, I hope this project also serves as an example of what can go wrong if we don't get the land use or the infrastructure right the first time. When we get it wrong, these are the kinds of expensive and disruptive projects we're forced to build. The district will continue guiding new development to avoid creating new flood risk and to create high functioning, low maintenance streams that will minimize long-term costs, safely convey floods, and create places where we're likely to see living wildlife rather than dead animal carcasses. I'm Dave Scudis, Watershed Manager from the Mile High Flood District. Thank you for listening.